Chasing the Racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one and welcome back to Chasing the Racing episode 169. And we're <laughs> delighted to be joined by Jason Griffiths. We're over in a, if you're watching this on YouTube, we're not in our usual studio. We've a makeshift studio in Jason Griffiths Motorcycles down in Castletown. And uh, thanks very much for, for coming on the show. How's things? Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. I'll tell you what I was thinking on the way over here. I'm thinking, how on earth is the Pirelli Racing Manager who based in British superbikes where there's no racing in the Isle of Man whatsoever get to work every day and I've just realised how close you are to the airport <laughs> you've probably got arguably the closest commute to work anyone in the paddock <laughs> yeah no it's a, it's a short walk you're right yeah that's okay <laughs> how far are you actually from here then or is it uh, to the airport you, yeah. can, you can walk it in 10 anyway yeah yeah ideal. A, a brisk walk yeah that's ideal so for each of the british superbike rounds do you just find which airport's closest and then just or do you tend to have to go to gatwick or something? well for the last few years to be honest i've been doing the ferry run so uh, in a in a van and yeah, then nice. do the drive the other side yeah yeah that's torture <laughs> that is torture no, hold on right for people that don't know right the boat takes four and a half Four and a half hours? No, nah, you've you bigged it up a bit. Three and three quarters on a it good, feels good like four, <laughs> It feels like four and a half hours, considering yeah. the journey it's going yeah. to do. Tell you what, a bit of island politics. When's this new boat turning up? I think it's sometime next year. But uh, right. yeah, I'm, I'm, I should know more than I do, but I, I believe it's next year, yeah. <laughs> well, you're never here, to be fair. You're never here. So, well, going off your accent, I presume you were originally Welsh? Yeah, yeah. You, what you're accent? Well spotted, <laughs> yeah. What accent? What, um, <laughs> what brought you over here? Well, I've married, got married here, so I uh, ah. met my wife at the TT, so that was the, the, the reason, yeah. So it's a long time now, it's, I've been here really 26 years, I think, something like that. You yeah. haven't lost your accent at all, have you? <laughs> well, maybe it's gone off a little bit, but people tell me not, yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go, well, keep, keep it in the blood, son. <laughs> where, whereabouts originally were you from? It's so a potty pool in South Wales, which is uh, about 10 miles from Newport. Okay, and were you um, like? <laughs> did you used to speak Welsh? <laughs> no, I'm not a not a Welsh speaker. So no, no. Is there, is there a, a language over here? Is there like a Manx? Yeah, yeah. They got uh, Manx Gaelic here, which is um, you know, there's a, in the schools now. It's encouraged the same as you know Welsh is back in Wales and that type of thing. Yeah, so keep the, the language going. Yeah, the kids, yeah. Right. kids get yeah. to get taught both languages. Well, there's a there's a school that specialises in it. So. Uh, you, you're obviously from an education background, <laughs> not so much me, so I don't know too much of the detail, but it, they, they are trying to keep it going, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I just noticed on, um, I think it was, it was like St. Ninian's Road or something, and then underneath it had, like, yeah. Nan, yeah. Nan yeah. like, something else, like a different language. Yeah, yeah, um, that's it, yeah. Have you noticed that? I'll tell you what, we've got a bad, like, a bad reputation on the show for, like, um, getting names wrong. This one episode we did ages ago, there was a... Uh, um, a Dubliner, and I, we could not get his name right. Oin, you know, Poin <laughs> Owen. Owen, right? Guess who was in front of me and signing on cue? And he just turned around and pointed at me face and went, "You and Chrissy cannot say my name for the love of God." I'm like, "We're not, we're not going down that route again. The pronunciation route. I'm telling you yes, that now." It, it, in Irish, <laughs> it's, his name it's is spelt uh, like e, e, is, Was it something like Eoin or something? Eoin, <laughs> something, something like it was nothing like Owen at all. Like not, a, and it's surname was closer to potpourri than anything else and he's oh, right in front of me in this queue i thought i was gonna get slapped rightly so as well so uh, go, going back right to the start obviously we'll we'll have a, a sort of run through of your career but i'm i'm aware your father was a successful rider himself yeah so he rode here yeah sort of yeah, born yeah. straight into the race and paddock yeah in a, in a way yeah yeah really and, and the motorcycle business as well then really because that's what he did so yeah all, all linked right. in really yeah mm-hmm. yeah and uh, was he a pure roads man, or did he used to do shorts? No, I, I, he would have been, you know, uh, Cadwell Park, and and I mean, going back Silleth and places back in the day. So you know, um, did a lot of that stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then obviously really keen on the TT, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so what's your sort of earliest memories of the paddock? Uh, we'd be coming to the TT, but uh, probably I don't know, it'd be seventy five or something like that, I guess, yeah. And, and being around then, you know, travelling in the van with the bikes in the van and that sort of thing, boat across, and yeah, yeah, and uh, that's the early memories anyway. Mm-hmm. So you met your other half at a race meeting. What about your dear mother? Did she just come in blindly to the world of boats? Yeah, yeah, nah, yeah I think well, she's, um, she was working here, so that's where they met here, yeah, yeah. Oh, so right. it was another co- one of those coincidences, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Someone in the Isle of Man, women, you see, there you are. Must be, it must be as simple as that. Have you got you got kids yourself then? Or? Yeah, no, I've got four girls. Yeah. Four? Yeah, yeah, four girls. Bloody hell. <laughs> Bloody hell. And the, did, did any of the, them ride? Bit, no, no motorcycle racing, luckily for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> luckily for the band, <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Yeah. So, going back to uh, your father's sort of racing career, what... Um, so he came over here, did the TT many times. Yeah, I've seen he, yeah. he got a podium and the t- did he win a Manx? And- he did a Manx, yeah, senior Manx in 1964 uh, and uh, then went on to the TT and did it, I guess, right up to about 76, I think, something like that, yeah. And, f- yeah. and from a young age, did you always have in mind that you would, a little bit like Dom, sort of following his dad, were you similar? Yeah, no, not sort of totally, really. I did a bit of schoolboy motocross for a few years and then didn't, didn't do anything for a couple of years before I started road racing, so... It wasn't a, you know, I didn't move straight from one to the other. There was a break in it, really. Mm-hmm. But uh, And then I decided I wanted to go with it. Yeah. And so, so what age was that then? So when was the break between that? Uh, well, I, I f- my first road race was halfway through 1990. So I would have been 20 then, I think, yeah. And I would have stopped motocrossing at probably 17, 18, yeah. Right. Yeah. What's the worst break you've had then in motocross? No, not not too bad in that. Really, she came out of it for, yeah fairly, fairly well. Just you know minor things like a wrist and stuff, really, but nothing. Were <laughs> you about to say yeah, like a female? Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> none of this, none of the serious stuff like that. Yeah, right. got away with that. Yeah. So where, where did he get to? And yet, like your motocross element was it just schoolboy? Did he go do British? Did he just uh, schoolboy stuff? Yeah, and schoolboy right. nationals and whatever. But then didn't really make the move to the adult stuff. That was when I stopped really, and uh, it took a couple of years before the road racing thing came along. So what was, were you just fed up with motocross, fed up with motorbikes and thought, I want two years off? What did you do in them two years? Never yeah, mind. I know, it's just just one of those things. I think when you finished in the schoolboy, um, you know, you, you had to move on and I did decided really it wasn't for me. So um, right. So that was it, took a, a break from that. Um, did I did help someone motocrossing for a little while, you know, so went along spanner in, so that filled the gap for a while. Right. And then g- gave up on that and then uh, found my way into the road racing stuff, really. Because I'll tell you what, it's one question that I, like a lot of people ask themselves, and we've talked about it many a times. It's like, what would you do if you weren't involved in motorcycles? And I have no idea what you would do, but I would love to know. What, there's a good question for you. What would you do if you weren't involved in motorcycles? <laughs> I don't know. It's been that long now, really, and sort of, you know, still involved in it in, on the business side as well. So it's, it's hard to find a way out, I think, really. It, your, your whole sort of life's orientated around <laughs> yeah, it, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And next week, <laughs> Pirelli manager packs in job, becomes a cowboy, or something like that. Realization. So, do you know when you started racing on on tarmac? Was it straight into pure road racing? No. Well, what? Um, well, my father was sponsored by uh, Ray Cowles, who was a, a well-known Welsh sponsor. Um, and Ray had he, he you know helped all sorts of people, depending on how much you know about the history. You know, people like John Hartle, who was a, a world championship rider back in the day. Um, and then you know you can go on through to uh, trying to think. Um, Gary Gary Hislop rode the bike. Brian Reed rode one of his bikes. So he, yeah, and then Ian Lucker, of course, won won the junior TT in 1990. And I was involved. I was there for that. Right. Um, did the Northwest with them that year. A couple of European Championship rounds. So that was when really I got the interest picked up. You know. Yeah. So I did a race. Um, first race was Darley Moor. In July 1990, right on a 250 Yamaha, and you were still down in Wales at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah, kind of community. Yeah, if yeah. constantly you think Pembry, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, if you know what I mean. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's just the way it fell that that was the first right. one that was you know a Darley race, and uh, remember it beautiful day and getting lapped by uh, Jimmy Brown. It was uh, getting yeah, lapped. yeah, yeah. That was the standout. It was a good 250 man. Were you, were you like, I'm not, this is not for me at this point, or? Yeah, it was one of those where if you just, you know, it's first time on the tarmac, isn't it? And you're fish out of water, really. But, You've got to uh, start somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, Dali's a strange layout with those couple of chicanes in it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so. a triangle with two, <laughs> yeah. the world's smallest yeah. Northwest 200, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> what is it about whale, uh, Welsh tracks and how grippy they are? No, <laughs> with Pembrey and Anglesey are like the two grippiest tracks, apart from Thruxton, you'd say Thruxton. Thruxton, Pembrey and Anglesey are the grippiest tracks in the wet. Have you <laughs> ridden either of them in the wet? They're like, the difference between a fast dry time and a fast wet time at Anglesey is like 
three, four seconds. Mm, sure yeah. same, yeah. same as Pembrey. Pembrey, you used to be able to get your knee down yeah. with dry tyres on it in the wet. <laughs> it's like literally outstanding. Yeah. But what, what is it about? Well, it's, I mean, some long, long time since I rode at Pembrey, but uh, I'm trying to think the last time I would have rode, there was about... 94 probably so <laughs> and uh, strangely enough I've never been to the track at Anglesey so I, I can't comment on that I thought you were about to say it was going to crash in the wet <laughs> I crashed there Chris it yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's a funny little yeah. track Pembrey and it doesn't really get used that it obviously Thundersport used to use it a lot yeah uh, but I think um, I think Dave fell out with the guy who owns it and that they no longer go um, which is is fortunate for me because <laughs> actually it's one of the only lap records that I still hold because they stopped using the yeah, circuit yeah, yeah. so therefore I've kept yeah. it for good but um, and also I think CR- for good <laughs> that's a challenge if anyone out there would like to dig out a bike C- CRMC I think yeah they still use it yeah, yeah. it's what why would British not go there? Is it's, it? It's is not it just really too up far? to scratch, is it, in terms of the facilities and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm going back to back then. It was, uh, I think they called it the Heat Super Cup or something. That was the last time that a major British Championship race, I guess, would have been mm. there. Mm. Um, that first corner would be carnage. Yeah, it? no, but I, you know, you're talking then. It was uh, obviously Hizzy was there on an RC45. Wow. Uh, Phil Borley would have been on a. Deckham's Norton and all those yeah. guys, you know, it was the Jesus. full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Simon Kreefer, I think, something like that. So, these, these, pro- proper race. Proper, proper yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah, um, yeah. Like a massive roll as you go around the last corner. So, as you go onto the straight, I'd, I only rode a 125 around yeah. there, but I remember you used to like be tucked in, go through the last corner, and then it was like a big, you know, up and yeah, down. Yeah. Um, I remember one, one <laughs> it was like my second ever race meeting was at Pembrey, and um, I was about, I'd have been battling for like 20th position or something in the race. And last last lap, last corner, I dive bombed two people. <laughs> like it was like a stupid move because I could have I could have wiped them both out, but like I dive bombed both of them. And um, my dad was watching on that corner and I remember I got, like had like an eight hour drive home. And I remember we both went home <laughs> like on cloud nine because I'd, I'd got like 20th instead of 22nd. <laughs> it's like, it was so irrelevant, but you know, it's just one of the pretty things that I, but uh, yeah, so from the like, say Darley Moor and getting your hand in, was it a case of did you start like club racing over there? Yeah, yeah, would have done a couple that year. I think Darley and the second one would have been Castle Coombe, um, which was a North Gloucester race. They were big, big group, big grids back then. Yeah. You know, lots of two fifties and three fifties back then. Ca- Castle Coombe's and so Darley Moor and Castle Coombe both tracks I've never been to. You've never done Castle, 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 Castle Coombe's good. I know Castle Coombe gets used quite a lot for the TT testing, doesn't it? it is yeah, right? yeah. Is Did. that is that because of is is it a similar tarmac or similar bumps? Yeah, or? it's as close. You know, into you, you obviously you can't replicate what what you're going to run into at the TT. It's just not possible. You know, but uh, at least Castle Coombe. It's not as bumpy as it used to be, as, right. as with most places. They keep obviously improving these places. So, uh, but it's high speed. It's got some high speed corners um, and some bumps there. So, it's uh, it's as close as you can get really. Um, Thruxton would be another good one, but it's you know it's nigh on impossible to get onto Thruxton. So, yeah. so that's a difficulty there. I tell you what, while we're talking about that, we've just finished like the Thruxton round at the BSB there. T- like even before I go down that question, why don't they use Thruxton as much as they can? And, and noise restrictions, I think oh, so. Right, the lo- yeah. Local classic, residents, classic basically. One. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't yeah. any local residents. It was just off the motorway. <laughs> I didn't see any local it residents is, at it all. Is, it is more or less in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? And it's a shame it doesn't get used more because it's a. You can tell me diesel bill last. Uh, <laughs> I, I bet. Um, I bet uh, from the sort of tyre manufacturer point of view as well, I'm, I bet you good that it doesn't get used much more because every every five laps you need a new set of tyres. <laughs> it's like ching 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 ching. Well, that can present problems as well, that Chris. So yeah, yeah. it's never an ideal. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a from our side it was a great weekend. You know, I mean, if you told me we were going to Thruxton and then you told me it was going to be 47 degrees track temperature, you know, I would I would have expected it to be challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, really pleased with how it went. That's- I know we're kind of we'll jump into this and we could go back to your racing career. But do you get like in that case when we're going through and it's hot? Do you is the pressure on your shoulders to like because obviously if if things go wrong is it is it you that people turn to to be like what's going on? <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously from from you know the, until the weekend's finished, you know the last the checker flag goes out on the last one, you've you've never got the job boxed off. But uh, now from my perspective, you know when you looked at the conditions for the whole weekend um, and, you know, how, if you like, ferocious the superbike races were, for example, you know, it was tough stuff. And uh, no, really, really pleased, you know, the, the material performed really well. 
So uh, we came out of there with a, what I think was a strong weekend. Yeah. Mm. What at what point is it like too hot for it? Like for because what range of tyres have you got? We keep I end up asking this question every time with the Pirelli questions, but because you got the zero, the X, you know what what temperature maximum have they got for that because like you're saying 47 degrees yeah i mean in, you know in terms of temperature you were definitely in 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 the x's condition but um you know you've got to look at the abrasion then and and uh, the circuit layout and and for example we decided at the beginning of the year that we'd only use the the zero option for thruxton um <clears throat> and if you notice we'll superbike were at moss shortly before us with mm. a, a you know a brand new uh, surface very abrasive and they they'd gone the same route so it was the sc zero that was used there um <clears throat> i mean you'd normally when the zero first came along obviously high temperature was one of one of its uh um a benefit of using the tire yeah and initially you would say a, a smooth low grip asphalt is where it's you know it's it's, it's benefits are but um but it stood up to, to Thruxton and has done very well, you know. Just for the benefit of the people uh, listening in, do you want to just give a quick rundown on what you, your official title is at Pirelli and what your job entails? Yeah, well, I'm racing manager for, for the UK. Um, so obviously, as far as BSB goes, it's it's the sort of delivery of the event on site from our side. Uh, and then away from the track, it's really uh, production planning production organizing you know and the logistics getting the stuff to the track so obviously you're talking about lots of tires um and uh, and working to that schedule you know are you involved with the the uh, performance side like improving the performance side of the tire no i mean from the um the development side obviously initially there's a test team based in in italy but um you know they obviously do some of the the, the initial work um, but then, obviously, with Pirelli being involved in World Superbike, you're fortunate if you've got Jonathan Ray as a test rider, or you know Scott Redding, or, or any one of those names, Bautista, that you want to throw out there. Um, you know, when when they move a new uh, tire or new spec to to World Superbike tests, obviously the the World Superbike official tests are perfect because you've got all of the factory teams there running on the track in the same conditions at the same time. So, you know, getting a, a balance of a product that hopefully works across all manufacturers, mm. um, that's a real asset, really, of, of, of test, being able to test in that way, you know. And do you know, say, going to a British Superbike meeting, how many, how many Arctic lorries do, do you take and how many t- sets of tyres on, like, an average weekend? <sighs> I mean, in terms of um, number of tyres, you, you're probably looking at, or you would be looking at, over 3,000 tyres. Um, and a crew of around about 15 people. Jesus. Yeah, so it's a, a big undertaking. Mm. And, w- and without going down the political route too much, but, you know, since, like, Brexit and getting a hold of things, because that's what they're manufactured in Italy. Is that correct? Well, no, the production is in Germany, actually. Oh, right. Yeah, um, outside of Frankfurt. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, where all of the stuff that BSB uses is, is produced. Because a lot of people, like not a lot of people, but people that are saying that it's quite hard to get a hold of tires in general, you know, like tire distributors for like club meetings and yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So is is that the, you know the whole Brexit thing just made your life twice as hard or three times as hard? <laughs> well, one of the benefits is obviously b- because of the size of BSB, it, it has a priority within the the company, you know, right, the motorcycle side of the business. Um, you're right. Obviously, Brexit also coincided with the pandemic, so. It was, you know, it was a double whammy really on on supply. Um, if you think back to 2020, there was a lot of uncertainty about when the series would would even start. So that was fairly interesting, and then I think six rounds for the remainder of that year. Yeah. But the, I guess, in a way, the bigger challenge was probably 21 when we started on the 25th of June and did 11 rounds b- before mid October or whatever it was. So. That, Look, that, yeah. was, that was a bit of a curveball. Yeah, a lot of tyres moving in, in short times then, you know. You, yeah. Have you been over to Germany to see the production? Yeah, yeah he's yeah. a wagon driver. Yeah. So when he's on here, <laughs> he's off to get more tyres from Germany. Do you, do you have a good understanding of like what actually goes into the tyres to make them? And that's, Well, that's it's good. changed now. Obviously, there's a, a lot of robot production now. Um, even when I first started with the company. So my first season was 2007. You know, there was still a lot more um, of a human element then in, in the production. Mm. 
but now it's it's moved on again, you know. So uh, mm-hmm. so it is different. And you know, who was I speaking to recently? They said they'd been over to do World Superbike Wildcard, and they said the World Superbike tires were much better than the BSB tires. Is that true? Uh, well, for example, when we talked about Moss, they used the same SC zero that you ran um, at Thruxton. Right. Okay. Uh, in terms of the front tire, you know, it's the same SC one front. There's also at the minute a, a development SC one front. I can't remember exactly, but for example, it's quite possible that Top Rack used a standard SE1 front and Jonathan Ray might have used a development one. So right, okay. it doesn't always follow that what's new or different is what they use, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see these spec- specifications appear there first, and then the decision is made on, you know, is it better? And, you know, there's obviously when you're working in a control tyre environment, if a tire is significantly better for one manufacturer, that's obviously not achieved the the aim. You know, you, you need parity as best you can yeah. across across all manufacturers. I, so I remember uh, a while ago I did a few European rounds and the, um, it ran a different system to BSB. So a BSB, you, you get a tire allowance. So for example, in superbikes, you're allowed to buy eight sets a weekend plus. If you get through a Q2, you get another set. Um, over, but you, you buy them as you go and you choose what yeah. you want. And also, once you've bought them, the your property, and you can either um, you can use them for scrubs, you can sell them as scrubs. You can, there's various things you can do. In World Superbikes, you had to pay upfront for your tires for the weekend, and then if it was wet, and say you'd bought like six sets of slicks, and you ne- you you only got to use two sets, the other four sets they would put a knife through them. Shut up, man. No, is, does that yet, still does that still happen? And yet you've paid for them. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I. I, I Going back now, I don't know what they do now, but it used to be within the entry fee. So I don't know whether yeah, they, no, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So almost ah. everything's included in the entry fee, so it doesn't strip out the tires as such. You know, yeah. that's the difference. But, as you say, in BSB, every single tire is is invoiced. So some riders will obviously use more than others. Yeah, yeah. If someone put a knife through my tire, they'd be like slapping my missus. <laughs> so that'd be the, yeah. the hell on. Well, it, the word "plastic" is yours because you weren't allowed to take them away. Yeah. <laughs> So. Oh, it would still break my heart. That that's like cancelling Christmas for a bear. And that would be like, how dare you do that to a tire? In terms of, do you know when you when you when you make anything, anything in production, uh, there's always a, a range. So if you go to like a Domino's pizza and you got like ten pizzas, there's going to be ones that are, are made slightly better than the others. There's always there's got to be some range. But obviously, as a tire manufacturer, you want to to close that range as closely as possible from from the very best set of tires that pr- come off production to the very worst set around say brands gp what do you think the difference is performance oh you thought of that one before you came here <laughs> didn't you that's not mediocre crap no, that I, is it i love it <laughs> i think you know when you're talking about we're, we're using um in bsb production normal production tires yeah. in in the superbike class Okay, Super Stock and or Stock Thousand and Super Sport use a special production tire, mm-hmm. um, but even then, because they're only made basically for us in the UK because we've requested them, they're made in large volumes. You know, it's, it's large volume production. So, for example, SC Zero, the factory probably doesn't produce a smaller run than five or six hundred tires. So the machine starts and and they keep it going, obviously, and then they're all cured together on the same time and, and that sort of thing so in terms of any difference between the tyre we would say no um, obviously once the tyre leaves us then it's out of our control so the variables being whoever's looking after the tyres tyre warmer yeah. how long they do that for their pressure gauge how accurate it is and then obviously the setting of the bike and many other things so once it's gone from us this product then you know it's down to to how it's prepared really and uh, so the, of the ones that could come straight off the production line are you saying that there's there's not much of a difference between them all they're all very similar we'd say because you know the compound is mixed together and, and all those processes happen at the same time yeah they, and there's a robot running the job so you know no no not prone to any human error there mm. is that all going back over over the years has that always been the case or has there ever been a case where like you know that like a certain batch is better than the other and you can like say when you were r- racing yourself did you always look for something on the tab like no i think it was just 
if you went back, there was more chance of, of something happening to, to one tyre, you know, if the machine operator had some grease or something on the fingers, really? then, then obviously that type of thing can can have a bit of, of an effect, you know. And, and also, even from when I started racing to now, I remember when I started racing, it was a big thing to, like, scrub your tyres in. You'd even sometimes go out in a warm-up to scrub your tyres in before a race, where that is, like, a mental concept for me now, yeah, because yeah. that seems to have changed over the years. Yeah. When did yeah. that change and what was that change? I mean, obviously, I race in the days of pre-tyre warmers as well, you know, so it was totally different then. Yeah. You, you, you obviously had to, you, you were scrub warming the tyre as well as scrubbing them in, yeah. So, uh -huh. But since, you know, the advent of tyre warmers, really, the whole whole thing has changed. I mean, people used to worry more about front tyres, obviously, but that's not the case now. You're out lap and, like you say, you're on the grid and you go for the warm-up lap and that's it, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember watching, like, I remember doing my, I did a wild card in, like, 600s, going from club meetings, everyone had the knee down out of pit lane out of Alton Park, I'm going, well, that's a mind-blower, <laughs> the first time I ever run on Pirelli, so I just go, you could not do that on any other tyre, you just couldn't. <laughs> in t uh, an another thing as well is, uh, so I, I don't personally run this myself, uh, purely down to a budget, but you can run a tyre pressure monitoring system in British Suit Bikes, so you can have the, it does the pressure and the temperature, doesn't it, so it's inside the yeah. wheel, yeah. and it can feed back to the data, so you can see exactly... Uh, on what lap and everything you can monitor the tyre pressure and the tyre temperature that must take some counterbalancing why is that? If that no just with, I've not seen this system but you think you've got a sensor it must yeah. be by the yeah. I mean it, it, there's obviously quite a variety of sensors as well so right. obviously the best the more expensive ones tend to be smaller mm. so how much would that cost then? Well, you can spend a, a lot of money. I mean, the first people who came in the British paddock with it were, were Honda Racing. Um, right. Remember, you need six sets of wheels, and they need to be on all the wheels. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it is so, quite a bit. So the initial, it's a big investment initially. It's about, yeah. it's about 20 grand. Yeah. If you go with one of the, 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 the leading systems, for sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what's from uh, before that to now, what's been the big lessons learned from from tyre pressure monitoring system? Well, I think, Chris, you know, but, for example, some would, someone would say that um, you know I, my tire in 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 the first part of qualifying was was perfect, and the second tire was wasn't as good, you know. And well, what was different? Well, nothing was different. But when you've got TPMS, you can see you you spot a variation between two tire warmers. Obviously, you know one's not working as efficiently as another. So, in the past, to say everything was the same everything was never the same you know it wasn't possible to know that everything was the same mm -hmm. what it allows now is when they have somebody managing this side of the the garage well and um, with all the data they've got you know they, they they're able to put everything out there as close as possible to being the same as the last tire. yeah sure and is the does it depend on the track temperature and the ambient temperature but or is there a an optimal tire temperature it very much depends on where you are as you say the, the circuit layout and then obviously ambient and things come into it as well um you know you'll even see differences between riders of course so you know how much spinning's going on and stuff like that so mm. yeah and yeah. what's the sort of range of um and be you know between different manufacturers on the same yeah. circuit you'll see differences for sure from from the monitoring system what what sort of range do would would you tend to see on track um well, I think if you, if, you, if you go back to Frexham, which is the freshest in mind, I guess, you'd see one of the manufacturers was, was running at 100 degrees. In the rear? Yeah. Holy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you'd see another make of motorcycle would probably run 10 degrees cooler than that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and wow. obviously people get caught up in, in surface temperatures, flash temperatures on the surface, but obviously what's happening inside the tyre is... Uh, is more important really and keeping that as consistent as you can and you know, can that gets you the what you're really looking at is is obviously the last five laps of the race and that's where all this work brings the benefit you know hmm. um, because if you damage the tyre basically you'll if you're running under pressure or whatever you're doing you're going to do the damage early in the race but you don't see the the negative side of it until you've you, you've shortened the life cycle of the tyre basically hmm. And that's when you start to struggle. Mm -hmm. So somebody managing it well in the garage um, certainly helps the rider, you know. When did the police come in with tyre pressures? Uh, 2019. 20, 2019. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 
Yeah. And so what, what was that like? When? Why did that get enforced? Is it just was such a clear advantage? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I th- really, the it would have been Silverstone 2018 when they'd resurfaced uh, the, the national circuit there, hmm. um, which, as you know, you basically just keep turning right in reality. So yeah, yeah, that was that was very very difficult for the tyre, um, and that's where the importance of this really came along. Um, and it was after that, actually, it was for the beginning of 19 that uh, Honda Racing uh, came with the TPMS, right. which is a McLaren system, actually. So right. you can see the level of, of, of technology. Uh, <clears throat> and they were able to find out lots of things, you know, straight away, lots of interesting in data, really. Um, and that uh, that benefited. And then as, you know, the benefits become obvious, other teams come on board. But... There is, you know, it's a significant cost, so it's not something that everybody can uh, hmm. can, can really get, get into straight away. And speaking of the different compounds you mentioned, so like say in BSB, there's a SCZ or an SEX normally. What's, um, in what situation would you choose to run the C, the Z or when does that, is there a temperature where it, where it then becomes an advantage to run the Z row? Um, 47 degrees, <laughs> folks. <laughs> As you you'll know from what you're doing, the SCX is is very versatile. Mm. Um, surprising, you know, surprising that such a soft compound can uh, can handle lower temperatures the way that it does. So really, the the zero has become less used. Um, obviously, we made it mandatory from our side for Silverstone and Thruxton. And you know, from my perspective, that's also quite interesting because a rider who wouldn't choose that tyre has to then work with it you know so it's pretty good that at <laughs> least shit sunshine, yeah, yeah <laughs> you know you've got an 11 round series and for two of them you know that you're going to have to work with that that mm. tire mm. um so is it a temperature thing so if it gets below a certain temperature you'd have to go to a zero yeah well i would say so it will de- depend on the circuit as well i mean you know we'd probably be talking I don't know, you'd need to see the track probably under 15 degrees or something like that. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And also... And again, you know, the short race on a Saturday will be easier for the softer tyre than the longer race in those conditions. Another four or five laps could be swing the balance, you know. And what about the front tyre? So there's the, the one and the two. The two is the harder of the two compounds. Uh, the one tends to be the, the ch- choice for most riders. Um, but what, why, why would... You, in what situation would you choose a two? Well, t- you know, the two... The two's a lot less used than it used to be. I mean, the one has always been the more favoured tyre. But going back to whenever it would be now, I think 2020, we came with the new, the current, what we call the big sizes, um, <clears throat> which was a, the bigger diameter and the wider front tyre. And that removed the use of the two even further. You know, there's more support than, than with the previous size tyre. So there were more riders able to use SC1. Um, I think I can remember at the time that it came along, you know, Jonathan Ray would have been a, an SC2 user with the with the old old in inverted commas 120 70 size, and he w- was able to move across to the to the new shape. You know, when you're looking at somebody who rides, you know, as aggressively as he can, it mm. tells you a story that you know there's obviously more support from from the, this size and shape. Um, Thruxton was a little bit different because temperature played a a role in that and we sold you know we more sc2s were fitted than at any point this year by a by a long way you know and was that because of the high temperature temperature played a a role in that yeah so what what, 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 makes why is is that so if the temperature goes up you would go harder compound no it's normally the other way around well in terms of rear tires with with our range generally the rule of thumb would be as the temperature goes up you go softer for the rear tyre. In layman's terms, because obviously we get a lot of listeners who just want to look at Chrissy's face and they don't understand <laughs> motorcycles one bit. You know. But um, why the hell does that work? Because when I first went racing, it was like, it's cold. Yeah. Get a soft, grippy tyre on yeah. it. it yeah. well, in layman's terms, can you explain that? Well, it's obviously the chemistry is different between the different tyre manufacturers. Right. Um, and from our side, if you, you run you know, something that's too soft uh, on a cold track, you, you just encourage cold tear, so... Man. That's what happens. The front tire is really down to to rider preference, rider feel. Right. Um, you know, you could say SC two on a cold track. You, you know, you get less feel from the tire, so the rider needs to be a rider that's confident to push, and you know, and ride 
uh, without getting that sort of feedback. Mm. Um, you know, because I've been doing this a long time, if I go step back to sort of 2018 and you think of Leon Haslam and his championship year on the Kawasaki 12070, the again old size in inverted commas, he'd ride on a two and it, you know, it could be Donington and it could be cold, but Crane of Curves doesn't matter. You know, he just obviously made, able to make it work. But not all riders can so can, he, can ride like that. He obviously. wanted the harder compounds, they're like hard on the brakes. It was giving them more support. Yes, but yeah. a- accepting that he's going to have less grip. I'm, I'm just going back to. Thrust I think in a way you got to believe in the grip. You just get less. You get less movement. You get less feeling back from right. through the bars. You know, yeah, you, yeah. feeling is a, is a thing. But if you can rely on 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 pushing and and make sure you're working it hard enough, that's yeah. something that some riders can do <laughs> I'm, beliefs, I'm little, <laughs> beliefs are strong <laughs> i'm a little bit co- confused about the the se2 to thruxton though so what in theory why why were people thinking that was a good idea because it's not a breaky circuit i've never raced around there myself but yeah it, i, I bit, think you know a lot of it really once you get the temperature up that high you, you know you get relatively low grip and and everything gets a greasy feel about it but uh it was and again, not not across the board, but more of them probably. I think there were a maximum of nine riders in in, in one of the races that used the SC two, and you know usually we would maybe see two or three, and that would be unusual now because it's predominantly SC one. So were, were they were then nine riders near the front? Well, the, the top three definitely were, but the were SC one. You know, the Yamaha is a oh, SC one. Yeah, they were SC one, but uh, you were going. Um, if I think of who was who was running on SC twos, I mean Christian Eden and Danny Kemp would have been SC two riders for right. sure. Yeah, they, uh, they, Danny Buchan, I think Andrew Ewing went to SC two. So yeah. Mm, yeah, right. Yeah, I tell you what, I've got I've got a question for the pair here. What would be the worst track if someone said it's forty seven degrees track temperature? What would make your ass nip thinking <laughs> here we come, here we go? You know, because that greasy feeling's an interesting comment yeah. that you said there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of my job and and you know. Uh, having the tyre deliver. Yeah. Now, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would probably have said Silverstone National. Really? But that's settled down in terms of the, the asphalt now. So mm. the hardest one would have been where, where we've just Excellent. exited, really, yeah. yeah. Well, right. You know, when we went, we stayed with distance, full distance races, as Mr Higgs had had, uh, had mapped them out, you know, so... Uh, Definitely delivered good. some good races, yeah. my, yeah. my God. Yeah. When yeah. All you see on bloody social media is those last couple of laps in <laughs> Superbike. It was yeah. just yeah. outstanding. Yeah, class. Um, I did have another question for you. I want, I want to go back to speaking about your career, but, uh, oh, yeah, um, do you do you also have an involvement with the road racing side of Pirelli? Yeah, Metzler? yeah. Um, so Metzler, hence we're, we're at a road race, so, yeah, Metzler. Is it, sure Metzler and Pirelli the same company, just two two different brands? Yeah, I mean, if you go back, I, I don't know the date, but it probably would have been early 90s, I think, that uh, Pirelli bought the Metzler brand. Um, if you go back far enough, obviously, they're two separate companies. Um, right. But uh, yeah, since then, um, Pirelli have owned it. Um, and in terms of motorcycle racing, uh, Metzler is uh, prominent in enduro, off road, um, and Supermoto from the company side of things. Mm. Uh, and then road racing, which this program started in 2013 I think from memory was when the Metzler road race program started so is it that young I thought you know just assuming I thought it would be yeah I mean if you go back it. again because I've been around so long I remember <laughs> you know uh, Foggy winning a F1 world championship on Metzler I think in 1988 or something there we like are, that yeah. yeah where that would have predated the, the Pirelli owning the company you know See, pardon my ignorance, I always thought it was just a creation from Pirelli, you yeah, know what I mean? It's yeah, been that yeah, much yeah, of a partnership, yeah, yeah. I didn't realise there were yeah, no, no, rivals. Was, it goes right back to then. You know, back, so. back when Superstock used to be Metzler, when they changed over to Pirelli, all of the lap records got smashed that year by like a good way. So there was, back then, there was the Pirelli was definitely a, a good step ahead of the Metzler. Have, has that gap sort of closed up and are, like for example now if you've got a Metzler attire for for BSB would it would it be the same as the Pirelli or uh, well there's always some differences in the in the range I mean this is the first year that Metzler now has the the current sizes the big sizes that we use right. uh, 12570 265 um, so they only came into the Metzler range for for this year um, so there are times you know when there'll be something available in Pirelli that's that differs from Metzler um, and in terms of the treaded tyres that we use with Metzler, obviously they were B 
built to be able to be used for road racing um, and the significant difference is always the center of the tire because of the high speed and not only high speed but also the fact that it's bumpy so the tire leaves the, the road a lot mm -hmm. and obviously meets the road again at pretty high speed so yeah. there has to be uh, you know uh, a center compound that will handle that safely and like um, you know you were saying about how world superbikes are developing the controlled series tires and you're saying that's getting transported internally so surely the Metzler tires from like the Northwest and the TT they must be coming straight back to you and then where do they go from that point to to improve development shall we say what for, for, for what, <coughs> what we do for the following year in, in road racing yeah yeah, you know. yeah I mean um, it's a a dedicated program that's obviously predominantly UK focused. Yeah. I mean, you know, you probably know more. I, you may have ridden in the uh, IRC or IRRC, whatever it no, is. No, I'd love to, though. Yeah, no, yeah, I've yeah. always fancied it. Like. So obviously there's road racing going on there, but um, the focus of this, <clears throat> of the project, is the, is the UK, hmm. um, Northwestern TT led. Obviously, Elsa Grand Prix when it was. Hopefully on, that's on, coming back. Yeah, there's yeah, there's rumours yeah. on there. That, do you know anything about those rumours? Nope. Damn no, it. I'm not, not Thought we had an excuse one, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Macau when it was obviously mm. which hasn't run for a few years. Because you've yeah. won them a few years in a row now with like uh, Glen yeah. Irwin. Yeah, yeah, we did. We've done well there and in the past again. You know, um, Stuart Easton and people like that. So uh, yeah. has he still got the lap record, Stuart Easton? <sighs> I think he does. You know. Say, yeah. I, you can't I drink for toffee. I know he listens to this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know in terms of the Metzler versus Dunlop sort of battle going on this year? It's obviously been a fantastic year for Metzler, and a lot of it down to the um, the issues Dunlop have had. Uh, have you got any any sort of justification or reasoning of what what happened to Dunlop this year? No, I mean you know it's it, the, the road racing activity. I think f first of all. If you look at these events, and obviously Dom is involved, and and you look at the tyre companies that are involved, mm. um, you know you've got two major brands there. Yes. So there's there's not, you know, there's not a. I don't like to mention other brands, but you you yeah. you've not got other major brands. They they're not involved in 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 this, that side of the sport at all. Mm. But so, to, like Chrissy says, they've definitely like um like like Dunlop and Metzler have totally taken the forefront. Of like road racing, yeah. Like, yeah. like Mitchell have got a little bit of a presence and stuff like that. Yeah, but there's, yeah, yeah. You but know, Bridgestone haven't got a present. Yeah. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's that many different brands like yeah, you were yeah, saying. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. Is that, can I just ask? Is that because the t them the other brands here, like Bridgestone and Mitchell, is that because they're not competitive, or is it because they just they've like focused on <laughs> world endurance and other things? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, again, I keep going back to you know when I first would have appeared around the TT, you were looking at five or six hmm. tyre manufacturers trucks there you know um, obviously you had 125s and 250s back then as well as 400s so there was a, a and morning and evening practices so the the volume at the TT was much bigger there were more riders in more classes with more practice for, for a start you know and you had the various production races so there was a lot of racing going on um, <clears throat> the thing has obviously gradually evolved into what we've got now um, so it's expensive to be involved in, definitely. Mm. Um, it's time consuming as well. Uh, you do need, or at least we think you need special product. Um, so, you know, that's the boring side of the business, if you like the commercial side of it, particularly during and now post pandemic, there's been yeah. a, an awful lot of pressure on production, um, material shortages, you know, <laughs> you've got the business people the, the accountants in the business obviously they don't want you making things that you're not going to use yes. they, they want to make things that they can sell so it's it's very difficult um, and again if you look at the Northwest 200 this year I think what it illustrates is how important the tyre manufacturers are particularly to, to that type of activity and I'm obviously somebody who's been around that part of racing for yes. a long time and been involved in it myself you know um, so it does show that uh, it's, it's important that there are at least two manufacturers wanting to be involved and hopefully staying involved. You know? Yes, 100% um, agree. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, do you feel like since the main 
the main uh, championships of when single tyre manufacturers or BSB World Two Bikes MotoGP and the that's eliminated the competition element of it. Do you feel like the, the speed of development? Or do you think that's hampered the development of the tyres? Um, I mean, I can only sort of comment generally on on the other series. You know, uh, looking from our side, I'd say Pirelli has tried to push and kept pushing. Um, again, I think you know in MotoGP, there's so much focus on MotoGP that uh, that they have to keep improving, and you know the riders are vocal when they don't appreciate what they're being given to you. So you know it's it, it, they need to keep pushing. I mean, it's interesting. I I can remember in terms of MotoGP when it went with it would have been Bridgestone first. Mm. That Michelin were very vocal about how they disagreed with uh, you know single tire supply you move forward to whatever it would have been 10 15 years and a different set of management than who's supplying motor gp now yeah things change nothing nothing stays the same uh, <laughs> yeah they get pulled up on quotes all the time remember when you said this oh uh, forget about that don't yeah, worry about that yeah so you know nothing stays the same like that hmm. um it's good that at least there's a number of manufacturers involved you know um that they do motor gp obviously done like motor two and motor three yes and uh, pirelli and wheel superbike so yeah you and spread you weren't kidding about the rain yeah. he did jinx it he did jinx it on the way in so we'll have to get grace and chris you do the audio so good luck on editing this bit out so it's, the rain has hit us <laughs> and uh obviously we're here in your showroom on the on the isle of man just down in castle town it's a sale 100 percent off everything yeah, you want to get down now <laughs> the door's locked <laughs> yes, with you behind it there you go bike shop down here so uh, um are you sort of, is it multi franchise here or do you have a particular? Yeah, no, we're, uh, I'll say it alphabetically, I guess Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Triumph. Yeah, yeah. And used bikes as well. Yeah, used bikes as and well. How, yeah. how long have you had this place? Uh, well, we've been in this building for coming up for five years, but I've been trading now for what, uh, over 15. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. as well as selling the bikes, do you do. You do um, do you hire bikes over here? Yeah, there? we do that. Oh, it's right. pr- primarily event based, so TT is the major one. Obviously, nothing for the last couple of years, but so, uh, yeah, that's so a for, great idea. So that. For, for people coming in and flying in for the TT, if they were interested in say hiring a bike and some gear and stuff, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, we tend to do it. It's easier done by by email, um, so then we know what's going on and when. What's um, it? say your email address so people? Have yeah, got. it's sales at jasongriffiths.im. Well, yeah, and, and a lot of it is is you know when it's TT you're looking at Americans and uh, yeah, and, and if, if you just put like chase the race and then the subject we'll just say ten percent commission. <laughs> <laughs> Double your prices and we'll take ten percent. Simple as that. We wish, we bloody wish. <laughs> Mind it is great. It is great TT week. All of the international fans coming round. It's like a proper celebration of bikes, isn't it? Like you say, Amer- America. I've got some American friends that come yeah. over here that absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, de- it's you know it's widened in that way. You see, it's such a it's, unique. So many Australians, you know, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, you just won't let Geordies on now. Yeah. Any, any Geordies <laughs> coming in off the flight? No, sorry, get stuffed. <laughs> Go on. Get stuffed. Going back to, to your TT career, you, you actually popped up in a, we do a newsletter, Chasing the Race newsletter now and again, and one of the newsletters we did were the the best the best riders to never win a TT, so the ones that came closest, and that, you, 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 you were d- delivered that nice and subtly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, you were mentioned in that along with, I mean, there's some fantastic riders that are, are in that list, isn't it? But saying that, with 13 podiums to your name, yeah. and 13 podiums at the Alaman TT is a hell of an achievement, isn't it? And uh, yeah, do, take us back to the start, so like starting at the Manx, I presume? Yeah, I did. Well, obviously, as I said, you know, Ian Luckard won the junior in 1990 on Ray Kells' 250 Yamaha. I was back the following year. Uh, he ran Robert Dunlop that year. And uh, Robert won the junior in 91. So I was in that pit stop as well. So that was uh, that was good. And then I did the Newcomers Manx in that year, in 91. Um, so I had that 250 Yamaha, which had won the TT that year. So... It wasn't a, a shabby bike. No, I tell you what, I did. I did pull a cracking photo off the wall. I thought you thought I was going to nick it at first, but this is why I wanted to bring it. Now I'm going to put this up to the camera, so you'll have to get on YouTube for the people who just listen to this on the audio. But that 
is an outstanding photo. Is that the year you were talking about there? Yeah, so that's actually uh, Aberdeer Park in... Uh, Abascare. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> June, that would probably be late June or early July in 91. So he's just won the, the TT on the bike on the... He, he's got his hand on. Uh, the other bike is the bike that Ian Lucker won the TT on the year before. So, so you set it up for him. Yeah. They are. <laughs> so, so that's yeah, that's those two bikes. Uh, he would just won the final, and, and I'd finished second. So it was a, a one-two. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's I mean, I tell you what, I do. I'm I'm loving the levers, mind the Bob <laughs> Bob he visor spray. That is was that like a personal sponsor? Well, or? that was. Um, I then rode the Manx on an RC30 belonging to Bob. Um, the newcomers Manx and that was uh, that was a, a bike where Foggy had used the engine at Daytona and it had the HRC flat slide carburetors on it it was a proper bit of kit that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was um, but that was you know I hadn't ridden a 750 which were obviously the big class then until we went to the Manx so it was sort of straight onto a bigger bike. So you went your first your first experience on a big bike was shooting off down Bray Hill. Yeah, well I'd run, run it in on the roads. And oh it was God. a t- Tony Scott engine, and back then, you know, where I lived in South Wales, you could ride around and put some miles on it. So that oh, was good. Yeah. Were you still living at home at this point? Yeah, anyway? yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, 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 fair play. Yeah, yeah. So I tell you what, we were talking about like you know the schoolboy had a couple of years off, and then at what point did you you know? Did you think I, this is serious for me now? Because you've got your photo, like having a that is a fantastic photo of you and Robert Dunlop having the crack, setting up bikes. At what point did you think I'm starting to get something out of this kind of thing? Yeah, I mean it was. A, I suppose I did the few races in 1990, and then the beginning of 91, it just sort of clicked really, and I started the wind club races then. Yeah. Um, and then obviously when you're spending time in the company of a legend like that, you know, it's, you 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 ask questions and and things rub off don't you and i mean the guy was uh you know he was something else um oh, well, in doubt. terms of racecraft you know um and understanding the motorcycle i mean it was in you know when robert really was on on the way up when he got hurt you know he was already a master of the small bike classes but yes. uh, he'd started to ride that uh that rc45 really well he'd ridden the norton well obviously you know so um yeah, I mean, when you know, I was I was lucky that year. He was in the pit in the newcomers race for me as well. Um, he did your pit stop. Yeah, he changed the visor. I think from memory, there's a photograph of that somewhere as well. Um, and you know, Hizzy was uh, I knew Hizzy well then. So, in terms of having guidance really for the for the TT course. You, couldn't, you couldn't, get, couldn't get any better, you know. Not a bleed. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, was it always because your dad got poured? It, that this rainfall is getting stronger, isn't it? So we'll have to shout even louder. But, like, when you went from, like, the club scene, was it always in the in the, in the the insight to go to the Isle of Man? Was it always the plan? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. The, the Manx was the plan, really, yeah. Right. Um, so that was 91. And then I won the newcomers race on the 750, I broke down in the junior on the 250 and then I finished second in the lightweight on the 250 at the end of the week. Dave Milling won it, actually. Um, so, hold on, you broke, went from the newcomers race and then you went straight up on the podium in the main race. Well, I was, it was the newcomers on the Monday. Yes. We did the junior on the Wednesday and I started number 95 in that, I remember, so right at the back. And uh, I think <laughs> I was running about six when I stopped at Parliament Square. I think it was the last lap. And then Friday morning... I had a really good number. I was number two, I think, for that. And uh, I finished second to Dave Millen, who won the race in that one. Yeah, yeah. So, hell. so I didn't stay. For, I could have stayed and obviously done the Manx again the following year, but I decided to go to the TT. What what sort of lap speeds were you doing back then? The the I think the well, it was a, the newcomers was 112 and a half. I think the fastest lap. Um, <laughs> Go on, and lads. It was a, it was a good uh, uh, Graham Ward actually. I think Graham was second. Graham, who's now helps um, oh, Alec Teig run Superstock Lads. Harren, yeah, 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 Brent yeah, Harren, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, probably know Graham. And of course, the uh, the legendary Nicholas Morgan was also in the newcomers race that year mm-hmm. of MSS Performance. Never, yeah, yeah, Nick yeah, Morgan did yeah. the TT. Yeah, the, the newcomers Manx that was. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. So did not know that. <laughs> no, I, bet, I bet it's funny for, you, for the likes of yourself that um, you, you know you've been in the paddock so long and been so involved with it, and then 
it's such an incestuous little place that like everyone sort of knows everyone and so and so's sons and it's like it is such a do you know it's a travel it's a traveling I like to think of it as a traveling circus it's yeah. class isn't it yeah. every summer we all meet up don't we in the same places then we move on to the next one and move on to the next one yeah but that, yeah. but like you say you've gone from what was your first initial feeling to it because when you went to the Isle of Man you must have thought Gee, I hope I like this, if you know what I mean. And then, what was your first lap like? Describe, like yeah, I mean, I'd already, what had I done? So, because of the, the involvement with Robert, I did, I think the first road race I did was Scaries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fair enough, the Alamar would have been a piece yeah. of piss after that. And right? then we went to a place called Four in the south of Ireland the week after. Is that a road race? Yeah, yeah, and I actually quite like that one. That was. That I've never, was yeah. I'm going to hold my hands yeah, up, yeah. I've never even heard of that yeah. one. Yeah, no, right? that... Uh, that one, that was a good one. That, they, those, so those two were together. I'm trying to think. Did I do? I did the post TT at Boulogne as well on the Saturday on right. a 250, and that was wet actually. Back when men uh, were men. Yeah. So we did that. So I'd done a couple of road races before I went to the the newcomers Max, and, and then first lap would have been on the 250. So yeah, but I'd done. You know, I was. I sort of geared up for it, I guess. Really. Yeah. Yeah. But like continuing on to that, like so you went, you thought, let's step up with the TT. Did you feel like a noticeable difference from going from the Manx oh, to the TT? Yeah, I mean it was, you know, I, I, as I say, it was morning practices, so it would have been a Monday morning. Another man, men were yeah, men situation yeah, yeah. there. <laughs> and I, I got away pretty early, and I remember, I think the first two people who passed me were Foggy on a 400 VNM bike, and Brian Reed, I think, going through Glen Helen or something, you know, when you just think. At five in the morning. Yeah, yeah. You, just, you, you know, you knew it. Well, you knew it would be behind you when you turned around, didn't you? Yeah. You and uh, these guys are coming past. And uh, so, that, you know, you were riding in that sort of company and end of the day. And oh, it can only make you better, can't it? You know, um, you know the two, that was that was a year his he won on the Norton. Right. Yeah. So he was starting. I think he rode number 19, you know. Um, and I remember him passing me on the 250 on the first lap at the top of Bagaro and it was like you'd never seen anything like it in your life, you know. <laughs> I mean, just, just sheer quality. And obviously, he passed you safely, but just sort of, you know, could have almost ripped the paint off your bike, sort of Gee, thing, the difference that. in speed, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, like, across <laughs> all of your TT career, what was your, what was your, like, your favourite, if you could relive one race, what was your favourite oh, race? I like that. Oh god, I don't know. I suppose in the it was, the two fifties were good to ride, yeah. Um, but to pick on one race now, I, I don't know which one that would have been. But, what, uh, what was the closest? I know you've had quite a few seconds and thirds. What um, what was the closest to a win that you got? Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's you think of the ones you didn't finish. You know, I I hurt myself in ninety five and had a really really good TZ two fifty from Dennis Trollop that year, and you just think that probably would have been a good chance. You know. So sometimes it's not the ones you finish, it's the ones you maybe didn't even start, you know, that you think yeah, back yeah. on. Because uh, James Hines on a Dennis Troller bike, or he bought a bike from... I, yeah, I, I, yeah he, well, I think he did, you know, Dennis, the last time we would... Well, 2019, Dennis was here, I guess, with oh, it, you mint. know. But, uh, and, and, you know, Dennis is a, obviously a real stalwart of motorcycle racing, and, uh, you know, he's helped a lot of people. Obviously, Bruce Hansi did a lot of... had a lot of success with Dennis... It's yeah. a shame he's not here this week. Uh, Bruce Ansey's unfortunately not racing at the, the Manx Grand Prix this year, which is a damn shame. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know the reason why, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you one question and show up another photo why. But what was your scariest race you've ever done? Uh, yeah, Back well, I know you, 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 you've got a photo. That was, I think, probably, again, I was in the, there was a, uh, what would that have been? It would have been a Formula One race in 94, the one that they stopped after a lap, uh, Nigel Davis was actually leading it at the time. They rerun it on the Sunday, right? Because it rained, obviously. And I remember I came down Bagaro behind Philip McCallan. Philip had passed me, and it had started to rain heavily at the bottom of Bagaro. And I remember just being sideways there on a 750 Kawasaki, and that was that was probably a, an eye opener, you know. Um, you and I think they stopped it when we got back to the pits, reran it the next day, and Hizzy just. Stormed up, demolished everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But do you think they should run wet races now? <sighs> Times have changed so dramatically, you know. Um, but being back then, that that was what we did. You know, you did wet practices. You did, you did, 
if it was foggy on the mountain you still you know you 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 had the half a lap or, or two thirds of a lap to Ramsey and then you 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 found your way back over didn't you but it was what you were used to you know oh you see but like yet again another one for the YouTube follower look at this for another photo how good the rooster tails coming off I, I think they would cancel a short circuit meeting now with the amount of rain coming off that is how it started where is that on the course that's coming out of Braddon Bridge that on a 250 yeah. Honda yeah yeah. That is outstanding. Yeah. You know what I mean? But now, like, it must be so difficult for the likes of, like, trying to pick, like, pick the opportune racing conditions now. Because, like, the TD this year was a fair struggle, wasn't it? And the weather wasn't particularly bad, yeah. but there was, like, a lot of situations, yeah. wasn't yeah. there? Yeah, a lot of it now, as you say, you know, generally, if you get in rain, you're probably going to have mist on mm. the high parts. And then that the helicopter has to be back then. They just worry about carrying you back later wouldn't they you know <laughs> now it's if the helicopter can't go then then the race isn't going to happen you know so things have things have changed that much did, did you have obviously northwest 200 we still we're well, racing yeah. in in all you know this year we would have used all the full range when we we're at the northwest 200 slicks intermediates wets you know mm, yeah so, did you have many big injuries throughout your career um touch wood yeah 95 was i i hurt myself twice so you know uh, leg breaks and ligaments so that, that sort of thing really yeah was yeah, that over here uh here it was a uh, in ireland was uh was the bigger one really but i had a, a an accident here it took me out for a little while but yeah mm. i didn't come off the bike actually I had a rear suspension mount broke mm. and i glanced off a wall and uh front disc sliced a hole from my boot and cut, um, cut my foot up and stuff like that so and, yeah i noticed but well, you're all brilliant you wouldn't think you've had <laughs> half your foot slackened off there yeah. and i noticed uh, looking through your history that you finished on the podium twice in in your fi the year that you ended up retiring which is quite rare like people retire at the at the sort of top if you like did what was your reasoning for retiring well, I mean, I was doing less and less then. I I was really just sort of like a TT racer, and, and you know, it was coming to the time where you they wanted you to do so many races. Um, you know, this I don't know what you have to do now. You've got to have done six races, haven't you? And and, and that yes. sort of thing to yeah, yeah. before you can do the TT. I mean, at that time, I was basically sort of wheeling out for the TT. Really, you know, it's um, still getting on the podium. <laughs> so it was again. It was something that wouldn't be allowed now anyway. No. Um, but uh, yeah, I started the motorcycle business in 2007 so and did that sort of just take over yeah it was one of those really i mean you know okay it was a centenary year but it's at the end of the day it's it's another race it's the same race isn't and, it do, do you do it or you don't do it i mean you know um, were, you, were you quite happy um sort of walking away from the sport did you find the sort of crossover okay yeah i mean it wasn't you know with, with starting the the business it it was busy anyway and uh the, obviously the pirelli that was I started with Pirelli in November 2006, so the BSB thing started in, uh, and it was still, 2007 was the last year of the open tyre supply, so Pirelli were uh, running um, R&D involvement in the UK with Rob McElney, with the, the Virgin team, mm -hmm. <coughs> and then still obviously Supersport with, at the time it would obviously would have been uh, TAS. Um, and thinking back probably a couple of other teams so there was you know quite a bit to do spanish testing at the beginning of the year and all that sort of thing as well as then the, the race program and northwest tt ulster so it was a, a busy enough year that one yeah to take your mind off it really you know mm -hmm. yeah you could lean on the fence at the tt and think uh, I, w I wouldn't mind being practicing now but you know that was about as far as it went i guess really. i would never class you as a civilian though he's got more he's got deeper roots in the motorcycle racing than john mcginnis <laughs> he's he's bloody pirelli and metzler for god's sake you know what i mean you're more involved than anyone else without a doubt on that side do, of things do you feel like you you sort of reached reached your potential within the sport but i think it's always things you maybe would have done differently but i mean you only get one run at it don't you and that's it really so you can try well, harder but on the other you could, <laughs> it could go wrong yeah <laughs> if you like the thing is everyone like talks about now how like dean harrison hickman have like changed the goalposts of like road racing by doing more british well he's he's perfectly in that timeline of like the hislops and robert dunlop and he's got like um i think i've already said steve hislop but they were all british front runners do you do you feel like you could have had that chance, or did you have that chance of doing British? No, I, I did um, short, short circuit racing, you know, when I, 92 would have been the first time, 
um, at British Championship level. Yeah. On two fifties, you know. Um, and I mean, when you think back now, you know, uh, Ian Newton, Paul Mara Brown, Steve Sawford, Jeremy McWilliams, Eugene McManus, Kevin Mitchell. You know Ian Challoner, all these guys. You, you, you just keep going and going, really. Um, I mean, the, the depth of the field back then was was incredible. You know? Yeah. Um, thinking, but probably, I think it was the end of that year. Even there must be there was a battle for the championship, and uh, I think Rob Mack and Neil McKenzie rode two fifty Loctite Yamahas as well. You know, in that race. So yeah. The field was just incredible then. You know, when you when you when you look back. Uh, great experience, great time to be riding, really. You know, without a doubt. Woolsey Calder, all the, you, you keep going with the names, you know. Yeah. So when you were talking about briefly there, it's like, what what would you have changed then? You know, you're saying I could have changed a few things. What would that have been? I think you know, this this times, if you'd had, you, you maybe if you'd had a bit more money to do something or whatever, you would have done it. But I mean, that's it's, you've just it's, you've got to work with what you got, haven't you? And yeah, uh, you know, it's always. At the end of the day, there's only one guy going to win the race, isn't there? You know, yeah, and that's it. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I enjoyed it. Still here now, so walking around, a little <laughs> few bumps about me, but yeah. While yeah. you were racing, was it mainly as a sort of privateer, or did did you sort of make a good living out of it? Yeah, I mean, in in terms of the the road racing, you know, that was the as well the steer. Um, you you could you could pick up some money doing that, obviously, and. Uh, I did quite a few Irish races as well, um, and you could, you know, if you had a good good weekend, uh, obviously you'd do okay out of it. You didn't have to use as many tyres, obviously, yeah, because you could reuse stuff or whatever. Yeah, so you went on like nine sets a weekend. Yeah, like no, you, you, were, you, know, you I mean, I can, you know, you, yeah, <laughs> I go to you go. Remember going to Killer Lane in the south of Ireland and getting man of the meeting and winning the two big races and not, not putting a new tyre on the bike, you know, that type of thing. And you were still racing with what, James Courtney or, you know, Major Archibald and people like that. So you were pushing on. But Class. <laughs> what, what sort of money would you would you take home from a weekend like that? Uh, 15 uh, grand a weekend. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know, back in the day then, I mean, it was probably the man of the meeting thing might have been 500 quid, you know. Class. And then obviously the, the race wins on top of that. And if, you know, you obviously had your ferry paid and a bit of expenses or whatever you you would have gone you would actually have returned more than the guy who won the corresponding British Championship race that weekend really but, but uh, he was obviously being paid to ride wasn't he at the time whoever yeah. that would have been you know but yeah did you ever now I've seen you at Macau plenty of times have you ever raced around Macau yeah yeah I did um, oh, I, right. I nearly went just after I started and that was one of those ones you know when I won the Manx it must have been the following year and I remember speaking to Mike Trimby and at the time he said I don't know you know I'll freight the bike but you 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 pay or whatever for yourself and it's one of those ones where you're looking what money you got and I thought oh no I, I, I can't do it you know yeah so I I put it out of my mind um and then I rode a VNM Yamaha at the Elster Grand Prix in whatever it must have been 2000 I think with David Jeffries um and I think Jim Moody was due to go to Macau with them and he broke his ankle or something. So Jack rang me probably, you know, a week before the race and said, do you want to ride the bike? So that I went from thinking I'd never, ever go and ride it to, to then go in. Um, and I did it in 2000. Unfortunately, the bike broke. Um, 2001, I think I got knocked off and I finished about ninth in 2002. Um, and then I started working for Yamaha at the end of 03. And, and could, didn't go then, you know, because the job took over. So yeah, and that explains the McGuinness link in two thousand four. Yeah, because yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. We, we bumped him room at the paddock because yeah. he was ah, he was yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, we were like, yeah, oh, I got yeah. you crack about Jason, yeah, think yeah, of it, yeah, like get a yeah. pub story yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he yeah. goes, oh no, because of Jason, he got me the Yamaha ride, right? yeah, which got yeah. his first um, superbike win. Yeah, no, he'd. Um, I'm trying to think, he he would have ridden Hondas in two thousand and three. That was the World Super Sport thing that he did, right? And, and I think he, that must have been a nine five four blade or something at the TT that year. And then, yeah, two thousand and four would have been. That was a year of a new R one, I think. Two thousand and four, I think it was a new model, mm. new model year. Um, so yeah, uh, the plan was, um, Yamaha France were going to build a bike for John. And mine was coming from Rob Mack's place. Hmm. And as usually happens with these things, nothing quite goes to plan and the French bike was late coming. <laughs> I'd actually gone, working for Yamaha in sales, I'd gone to Japan with Andy Smith 
for some new model introductions there where you get to ride a couple of new bikes so i i missed the first practice but um with the bike being late then john got the uh, the bike that was built at, at rob max place and i waited for the the french bike to come so yeah that was he won he will have won the formula one race and was leading i think the senior when i think the clutch went or something oh. on his bike yeah yeah, and so. I know you, you briefly just touched upon the Ulster Grand Prix, but obviously you were you were very successful around there. Uh, Pippin Joy Dunlop to a win uh, one year. Uh, what was what was that? Is that, is that you showing him the line on that? <laughs> <laughs> you want to? We'll get in a bit more joy. <laughs> yeah, that that set on the start line, I think, in '96 or something at the TT. But uh, yeah, and I was fortunate to again going right back to the links with with Robert was the introduction to Joey, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, great, great guy to be around and to race with. You we, know. Were you sort of, um, no, that race, Hickman and Lee were passing each other like that. Were you kind of like that? Or, I know it was a tight finish. We had a really good race at the Southern 100 in 94 um, in the championship race then, which was 12 laps back then. It was longer than it is now. Jesus. And it went down to the last lap. But um, it was, you know, when you think of Joey, I knew, I knew Joey pretty well. Obviously, he kept himself to himself a lot of the times. But... Um, He'd ridden the 125 that morning um, and it had been damp. You know, it was wet, it was a damp day basically. And he, I only had one race that day, which was a championship race. Um, and if I think back, he, he won the, the 750 race on the Tuesday night. I won the one on the Wednesday night. So this was then the, the, the big race of the week on the Thursday. And he'd won the 125 that morning and seen the conditions. And we went to the, the, uh, lining up area there you know on, oh. the, the, on the dummy road or whatever and I had intermediates in my bike so we were, we were both sat there and he actually said to me get those intermediates out and put slicks in he was sat there on slicks you know and he could have said nothing and just left it but the mark of the man was you know he so said you don't if you, I'm gonna beat <laughs> yeah you don't need those you need you need slicks so then we raced and raced for the 12 laps and I passed him going into the town corner We'd passed each other before, but yeah, just just beat him over the line. But uh, if he'd said nothing, he, <laughs> you know, the, it, it, that just really shows what he was like, I guess. I, I'm saying this now, there won't be a single racer alive now doing that, will there? <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> God's going to be like, it's yeah. on intermediates, get in. Here we go, I'm off to yeah. Rotterdam. <laughs> uh, no, great, great race. And, you know, you knew when you were racing with him in terms of style, safety, all that sort of thing, you know. It was all uh, all top notch. Oh, class! Mm. Who's been your is that is is that answered in this next question? Who's been your favourite racer, your favourite competitor to be on track with? Oh, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, difficult when you know with a lot of those guys in, in two some of the two fifty races then at the Northwest and stuff were that close. You know, you were racing so closely with with some of those names, really. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, standout race would have been that one. Um, I had a great. We had a. That was the same year in '94. Had a great Elsa Grand Prix race. But the first race was with Joey and Philip, and then the second race, Joey. Something had happened to Joey's bike. I think it was me and Philip. So they were uh, they were great races as well, you know. Um, but some of those Elsa Grand Prix races in 600 races later on were very very close. So you you're in close company for a lot of the time. Yeah, class man. <laughs> Absolutely, and, um, class. Well, obviously, very over, jealous. Well, obviously, <laughs> over here at the moment, and it's the the Manx Grand Prix now. Don was sort of filming us in on a little bit of the history of the Manx and the classic, and like the sort of what the changes of how it's gone. Do you want to um, do you want to sort of explain that what recently changed? But, to be honest, a lot a lot has changed recently because it was. I'm trying to think when, because the Manx Grand Prix has always been. That's been it's century century tenery someone correct me on my uh, announciation there that's the one but it's in is that in two years from now so this next year is the 100th year of the Manx Grand Prix is that correct I think you're right yeah, yeah, yeah. I th and then um, so the history of the club's been there for years so no the TT has always been ran by the government so the Manx Grand Prix is actually a club so it relies on supporters and then but obviously them essentially hiring the track off the government there's always been like a bit of cross-pollination shall we say but it's always been known it's a little bit more of an amateur TT, hasn't it, with the Manx being club level. But it seemed, I'm trying to think what year it was. I think it was 2000. This is testing my knowledge here. 
2013 or 14 when the classic TT got introduced. But at that point, they always had classic races within the Manx Grand Prix races. Mm. But then at that point, I think Ryan Farquhar was actually one of the first crossover TT riders that actually came from that. But then that's when they separated the classes off, saying, well, this is now the classic TT and this is the Manx, because they didn't want the history getting affected, really. And ever since then, it's always been the classic TT and the Manx. But this year, it's all fallen back into the same category. But like like every human nature, no one likes change, don't they? So it's gone from what it was to something different, now back to what it was. But it's, you, it's, you, it's mental, isn't it? It's, it seems to be a lot quieter than it has done in the past. At the moment, it's it's been a bit... It, it, the, quiet, the paddock is really quiet this year. Like normally, you always compare it against the TT and we've had two to three years without the TT and it's been like, whoa, this is a shock to system and everyone was trying to get back to the returning party. But mm. this year, everyone's a lot more forecome with a plan, really, because normally they always try and run it tonight, don't they, on the Saturday and then not enough marshals yeah, normally yeah, turn up yeah. and then they, the, the always the full black, the back plan, sorry, was to run it on the Sundays. So now tomorrow, because we're here ruining his uh, Saturday evening at seven o'clock on a night and it's... Um, no, so we're going to be running tomorrow. That's the plan. So hopefully the paddock will fill up a little bit more. But there are less entries this year. They've had to lower the numbers for the safety element. And the, oh, it's, it's mad, isn't it? You, you've, to move forward, things have to be sacrificed. And it seems to be that case, yeah. Also, Don's getting to tick a massive thing off the bucket list this week. Running, Losing my virginity. Running, yeah, yeah, there's uh, a girl. <laughs> drunk running number one in, in the 250 race. Oh, so right. going, yeah, off, yeah. going off down. Did, it, did you ever uh, run number one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think only one year. Um, in what class? It would have been in all classes, but I only started a <laughs> Formula One race, I think, and that was it. I didn't write anything else that week after getting how, hurt. Yeah. How did oh, you right. find? How did you find? Oh, God's sake! <laughs> <laughs> after I get it, cheers, cheers, cheers. And thanks for the pep talk. So thank you very much. I thought you started wearing dark glasses because it was number one. Oh God! No, I'm bleeding. Wish no, I'm medically bound to these things now. Medically bound to them. But there we go. But so I'm going to change my number. I'm going to have to ring Paul Phillips after this, please. Go ahead, change um, I'll grab the Patreon question. Up. Uh, but no, I, t- I tell you what, two strokes were taught. Like, my first ever experience on a two stroke was John Chapman's bike, 2019, and I went down Bray Hill. Never ridden a two stroke, <laughs> never even ridden a motocross two stroke. <laughs> and it was just, and everyone, this is one of my favorite stories, is like, everyone says the same things when it comes to two stroke. Goes, you'll love it, Dominic. <laughs> Quickly followed by, but it's going to hot seize, it's going to cold seize, it'll seize if you go left, it'll seize when it goes right. Always cover the clutch, don't roll the throttle, don't crisp this, make sure that's right. Always keep an eye on the temperature gauge, whatever you do, do not go uphill, but you will love it. And I'm going, how the f- how do you ride one of these things? And my respect for those bikes are phenomenal, because I'll, I'll send the photo to Grace, and um, I've got a photo of me coming over Balacry, right? And it just went vert, you know, like Max Biaggi vert. And there's a photo of me, like negative throttle, trying to bring it down. There is no engine braking <laughs> at all in the motorcycles. <laughs> I just, I tell you what, have you got any? I did probably the worst thing, and I'm going to repeat that mistake and ask for advice. So, what is your best advice you can give to me? First of all, for going down the road at number one and two strokes. What's the best advice? I guess in terms of two strokes, don't don't get carried away and jet it too lean because uh, right. I, I remember insisting on doing that once and getting it wrong. So yeah, I mean that's uh, something you could do without doing. And uh, the number one thing, I mean, uh, you know, it's 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 great, isn't it, to go off at number one? But you know, you've only got people chasing you then at the end of the day, so you've got to try and be on your game. Yeah. 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 Definitely. <laughs> oh, God. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely looking forward to it. But there we go. So we've got any Patreon, Chris? Yeah, I've got quite, quite a few who have sort of naturally gone through, uh, like during the interview. Um, let's have... Peter Thompson was saying about the final uh, TT when, when you were on the podium. Did you know at that time that you were going to retire? Oh, yeah, I, I did. I, I decided really myself that that was it, so yeah. the, the, Do you know the last race that week, were you lining up on the grid thinking this is the last time I'm going to go down there? Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, that would have been a senior race and actually I had a, a problem with the bike, so I stopped in that race. So I didn't finish my last race, yeah, yeah at the TT. I'm wow. trying to think now. I think I rode the Elsa Grand Prix that year, I think, mm. after. So that yeah. would have been my last We've, we've been doing these podcasts for ages and like out of all the people that have retired, you seem the most like... 
as if, oh yeah, I finished and then I just sort of went on to the next thing and it, as if it wasn't a big deal. Like, is that the way you sort of, you just seem to have like um, got a, another job and kind of kept busy, but just to switch your focus across. To yeah, but I, the thing was I'd been doing less racing, I guess, Chris. So, you know, yeah, it's it sort of weaned it off it really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, when you're doing other things, I think, you know, I mean, I, when I did the, you know, the, the, the year in 2004 when John rode with, with you know, on the Yamaha, I was working for Yamaha, and as I say, we're, you know, been in Japan for, for, for Yamaha business, and usually missing the first practice would probably have really sort of freaked me out, you know. But it just, it was almost relaxing to ride the bike then, you know. It had become a different thing, so yeah. it felt different, and it, it just felt, you know, it was more enjoyable really than putting yourself under a load of pressure, I guess. So mm. yeah, that was the way it worked, and and it was. It was oh, great. I'm at the TT. I'm going to ride the bike, you know, rather than all this big build up and thinking about it. You've been busy doing something else, so it just arrived then, and and it was easier to to enjoy it, I guess. Well, you know, and still remain fairly competitive, I suppose. There we are. Question great advice. From, uh, Lee Bartram. What does Jason think of the proposed changes for next year's TT with the new extended race program and senior on the Saturday? And if that's there. good, that's good. I yeah, I mean, um, what are the proposed changes? Extra stock thousand race. That's right. Yep. So two stock yeah, thousand yeah, races yeah. and an extra super twin race. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? Yeah, and a, a one less super sport then is it? I think is it one less. It's oh, one, right. one race instead of two, I think. No uh, way. I think so, but I thought you'd know that. I don't know. I'm looking with a blank expert. That, that is interesting. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to dig yeah, that. I'm not one sure up. on that one, but I mean, it seems like a lot of racing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the weather obviously being a, a key factor in it all. Yeah. Um, we raced the senior on Saturday this year, but uh, yeah, I mean, looking at it from from the side of the racing, as I say. You, you, what's going to happen weather-wise, how many races are going to run close together and things like that. I mean, if they get perfect weather, but how often does that happen? So, yeah. <laughs> got some, got some, everyone was in paddling pools at Thruxton, yeah. like screaming yeah, for yeah, air conditioning yeah, yeah. a little like yeah. a week ago and here we are yeah. and it's pissing down. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. And it may, definitely makes it three full weekends. You know, it's going to be an interesting programme. Let's see what, how the, BSP program relates to road racing with a Northwest 200 fits in. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be busy and oh, hectic. Without yeah. a doubt. I'm not yeah. sure if you'll have, uh, have seen this because obviously you've been busy at work today, but MotoGP have just announced that they're go- for, from next year they're going to be running a sprint race on a Saturday at every round. Right. What uh, um, do you think that'll. Do, I mean, do you follow MotoGP very closely? I, I follow it. I wouldn't say, you know, incredibly closely, but uh, I do follow it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's, that's obviously More an in, interesting it. innovation, yeah. Speaking of uh, Thruxton, obviously it was um, it was quite a big big deal for BSB that we had Tito Rabat, obviously ex-Moto2 world champion, join join the series for Tag Honda. And it was obviously a big talking point going into the weekend. Uh, famously, Gregorio, Gregorio Lavila from Spain. Spain as well uh, came to Thruxton for the first time ever and, and won on his debut yeah. and there was lots of uh, talk about how would Tito get on uh, obviously he's been racing he's actually leading the Spanish Superbike Championship at the moment and he's used to Pirellis and all that sort of stuff uh, but not used to riding bikes without electronics and obviously never been to Thruxton uh, we personally had a so I, I put a thing in my team group chat like a, <laughs> I said I'll, I said I'll give £10 to the, the person who, who gets the closest and um, what will Tito's best result this week, weekend be and I started I, I thought P10 and then pretty much there was like my electronics guy Simon said P8 and then quite a few people said sort of P15 P16 around that his best result of the weekend was P26, which the, of my team, there was only one person who was Roy, my tyre guy, who said he'll struggle to get in the top 20. He was the only person that was sort of correct. Um, Have you, you paid s- him? Uh, I don't know, I haven't actually, but I you will. Cheap I will. Of it. I will, I'll give him the tenner next time. <laughs> um, were you surprised by, by or did, did, he, did you expect him to sort of be last? Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't think back to Lavia. You know, I didn't make any comparison really. And mm. whilst I tend not to f- focus on individual riders within the job, you know, I mean, you must expect- be sick of them all. To be <laughs> fair, like I'm fed up with a lot of you. <laughs> my, you know, my expectation. I didn't really have an expectation from of him. Um, I, you know, it didn't surprise me. I'm sure he was surprised by the circuit. I'm sure 
it was a bit of an eye opener. Mm-hmm. I guess I guess it's a good warm up for Cadwell Park if you're yeah. going to do it. But yeah. apparently, it said to someone something like this: "This isn't super bikes. It's like a cross between super bikes and flat track." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, which is true because yeah. it is like. And you know, the, the, let's face it: the, the competitiveness of BSB was always going to make it difficult. Yeah, so, you know, it's a difficult place to go, for extent, as you say, with so wide open and no reference points and things yeah. like that. And it just show how well Livia. Livia did Do you know, over, over the history of your job in BSB who's been the most sort of annoying rider that's like always coming and whinging at you about like, the tyres and <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, don't, I don't you know I don't think there's anyone in particular there's people you know there's people you expect to have a direct approach I guess you know um, but uh, it's been a long time and you know, dealt with I suppose thousands by now of, of people with uh, you know we've all got <laughs> thousands of annoying issues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And do you know? Do you know? Like now and again, doesn't matter which tire manufacturer, you're always going to get the odd duff tire, and it's th- th- there's probably people probably use or had a duff tire more than they actually did. Like it probably it is probably more common in the excuse book than it is in reality. But if you had to say sort of one in a hundred, one in 500 one in a thousand tires how many duff tires are is there really? it must be such a small percentage yeah i mean in terms of of what we do you know what you can get is you can certainly get a tire damaged in transport when you're moving so many of them yeah. and what what would happen or does happen is generally anything like that gets picked up in the service anyway you know so by the time it's gone through the fitting machine and the balance with two different guys looking at it something like that will get picked up so in terms of when you're looking at percentages of things like that no, it's, again, like it's, I, it's minimal you know you're, you're if you're you know if within 1500 tires you're pulling one tire out that doesn't even get on track you're the maths expert is that the sort of numbers you're talking <laughs> that's about that's the sort of numbers you're, you're, you're looking at yeah and like i say generally that would be something from transport and it might just be something that ultimately is cosmetic and no more than that but obviously because we see it we wouldn't we wouldn't put it out there you know yeah um so yeah i mean so because it's you know the, the the factory from my side i'm pretty comfortable the factory is in germany <laughs> you know they do a good job i mean uh, G- the germans are renowned for engineering and precision so that's uh, that sits well with me mm-hmm. and uh, makes my job a bit I, easier. I just love the competitive. Oh, hold on, um, where are Dunlops made now? The French bought out Dunlop, didn't they, in Birmingham? Is that correct? Well, I mean, the, the production they use is from France. Yeah, it the, is the, the, the the production facility in in Birmingham went whatever it was five years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. see, that's what I love about motorsport. It always just filters competitive nature. Always filters down, doesn't it? Because you know what I mean. Now that the product's made in Germany, so it'll be the Germans against the French, and then it'll be something from it's, there. Then the chemical experts will be having a fight with each other. Do, do you know the whole um, <laughs> issues going on in Russia and Ukraine? Is is does that affect the tire supply? Yeah. Um, earlier this year, it was definitely a, a bigger factor in some of the car motorsport. Um, productions. Yeah, I was, I was actually it. speaking to one of the uh, Eurosport commentators. I was down commentating on the uh, Suzuka Eight Hour. Name drop. And in, in between, in between stints, I was speaking to one of the car commentators. Yeah. And he was saying that uh, it's maybe not Pirelli. I don't, I don't know what the manufacturer is, but they're, they're having massive problems, and I think that is linked with the Russian thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, 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 it's definitely affected the car side more more than it has our side fortunately yeah Yeah. well thank god for that i'm a bike fan so (laughs) (laughs) the cars could have a problem for a change with all their billions Mm. i'm very biased chrissy i'm I'm not gonna lie i'm very biased do you think um it's a funny one with tires obvious obviously the tire manufacturers want their tires to do the fastest lap so and often that's why sort of qualifying tires are brought in because they it's almost like a bit of a dick swing competition of like <laughs> who, you, you know you might only get one or two laps out of it but if like pirelli can do this lap mm. time it's good to sort of yeah. sell tires yeah. on however in terms of financially it, um you kind of want tires to well there's two two sides of it the teams are kind of one and the riders are wanting tires that are going to last at 
minimize the number of tires where obviously the tire manufacturer it's in their interests to to use as many tires as possible to get more more yeah. revenue yeah um do you think there's gonna do you think there'll be a shift more to sort of more qualifying like softer tires and you get more through or do you think the <clears throat> environmental movement is gonna have a big push on make because like environmentally it's it's um if, like let's say if you were an eco warrior and you came to BSB and you seen people putting a set of tires on for five laps and then going into landfill, it's like at the same time. Right there, if, if you if you believe that the world is like on the edge of destruction and you like say there's I mean there's loads of people that do genuinely believe that and who are happy to like lie down on the M25 to stop cars going to work. Idiot. At the same time, if you see what was going on in like racing. There's a there's a sort of Chrissy, you, Chrissy, seriously after this question right and this sport gets cancelled I will personally <laughs> bury you in the woods. Do, do you feel like the I mean is is the much of a, an environmental push at the moment on ta- things or it, is I, the blind spot until I pointed it out? <laughs> <laughs> yep, you, uh, you Jason, you probably escalated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now I think you know within BSB there's an awareness of, of what you know. It, everything that's come in with the electrification and everything like that so um you know it's something that we've got to be aware of and you saw moto gp um change their allocation this year slightly yeah. you know not a lot but uh what what happens to the tires like do they just go and land go after no nah, they usually they go back and they you know made into um, bases for school playgrounds and all that sort of thing you know oh, but, yeah, well yeah, recovered yeah. So there's, always, there's always this element of uh, yes. recycle and reuse yeah yeah, yeah. i'm yeah. trying to think of so he's just single-handedly yeah. saved motor sports. Right. Well, you know road, road, road bases all these type that's of things it. yeah I'm saving got, children's lives chrissy that's <laughs> what we're a, doing i've by got now. a load of tires uh, obviously like use tires that and i'm desperately trying to think what can i make out of them to then recycle them into like to to make some money so i'm thinking like I don't want to give my business ideas away, so I'll keep them. If anyone has got any good ideas, though, let us know. And then we'll nick them and make the money. I'm desperately trying to think of something cool. (laughs) Flower pots for me, mum. She's got millions of them just painted white. They are, man. There's a couple of sets of metalers for you. (laughs) Merry happy birthday. We've got them to be fair, like in my garden. Oh, you do. I think every bike race has the same thing. Um, in terms of, so obviously this podcast is going to go out and this week you're, you're going to be racing, so Indeed, obviously yeah. be- best of luck with that. And then we're off to Cadwell Park next weekend, so big, yeah. big weekend. Uh, for anyone that's watching, the, it, there's an open pit lane BSB evening on this Friday, so uh, 5 till 8 p.m., um, I believe it's free, free entry as well. So if anyone wants to come, it'll just be super bikes out for three hours, um, and it'll be a, and obviously the rest of the weekend, fantastic circuit to spectate at. Uh, I think camping tickets will be sold out by now, but the entry tickets are still open, so it'll be a class weekend. Um, and then have you got gone? I was I was gonna give a shout out to Bennett's. I got to have a go a safety car lap around Thruxton. I've never been, I've never even driven to the circuit in my life, so I got absolutely spoiled that day. What a circuit, what them safety car laps. You have to be a Bennett's customer to a, apply for one of these laps. I cannot recommend it high enough because them boys do not hang about either. Like I just said to them, come mate, just try and scare us. And I'm like that going, how tight is this seatbelt? <laughs> Jesus, we're up there are flying. Yeah, so you, you'd never been to Thruxton, I just Never so. been to Thruxton, my life. I'm going to be very honest, in my opinion, which is not going to be very popular, crap place to watch oh yeah there's exactly. obviously no there's some highlighted points which are brilliant yeah. but it's not like, like let's talk Cadwell you know what I mean you can get everywhere and everywhere around Cadwell and you can see the race the entire way around but Thruxton's very a difficult place to watch it was definitely I would say it's probably the worst spectating um, yeah it's great to, to ride but as a spectator it's probably the last one I would recommend to come and watch at uh, there's not, not a great deal happening happy days but shame you're not hanging around a bit longer you could have got a flight with you know Jason here they <laughs> split the split the flight are you dry, Are you flying or driving no I'm driving oh god love you yeah, I couldn't know that is that is literally the only thing I don't like about the Isle of Man <laughs> That, that boat it's it's torturous but um on, have we got anything else there chrissy or i have actually got have you got anything um, else would you like to ask <laughs> we never ask the guests <laughs> that we just we just stop the show we're like and that's us done see you later <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, um, in terms of the, obviously we've already plugged the, the higher business, so for people coming over here they can get, get in touch literally just around the corner from uh, the airport and obviously for any of Isle of Man residents there's plenty of motorbikes here and uh, nice gear. Um, You're going to help me wheel out the 765 Moto 2 bike <laughs> he's got in the top corner there, yeah, that's what some, I'm racing. Got some nice bikes. <laughs> um, just a little shout out for me, I was speaking to Lundy the other day and as we've already mentioned Lundy's retired from racing, selling some stuff and he was selling his uh, he's been racing in the cb 500 class and uh, he got he got speaking to someone like selling some wheels to this guy and the guy said oh your name's familiar and he said oh do you listen to the podcast and they got chatting to a guy called tom middleton and um it it transpires he actually tom tom actually got into racing from this podcast like big, big fan of the podcast and, ruining uh, lives yeah decided <laughs> to to buy himself a cb 500 road bike turn it into a race bike and goes racing so i just thought so I'd lundy's going an extra 200 quid get in <laughs> yeah. i'm not knocking anything off so, this son. just a, a shout out and best of luck for the rest of the season um, and yeah, huge, huge thank you to all of our patrons, to our sponsor, Colchester Kawasaki. And uh, thanks ever so much for your time and coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Have, uh, have you, t- I don't suppose you do any sort of social media or anything, do you? I'm totally out of social media. It's never really stepped in, yeah. So it's washed over me, all of that. Uh-huh. There we are. Well, we know where he is every BSP weekend. He's at the Prolly Truck. So if you want to go and say hi, by all means, there you go. But honestly, thank you so much for your time. It's great to have you on. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you later on. All the best. Take care. Thank See you, you in a bit. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks. <laughs> Chasing the Racing, powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt, and Benelli motorcycles.